So one of the capabilities of our system is that as I'm speaking, the message can be recorded onto a thumb drive so that we can upload it onto the website, onto YouTube, onto some other media so that folks who aren't here are able to listen to the message. So we're, we're still working out the logistics of pushing the right button at the right time, but I think we're good. Right, John? All right. So back in 2005, while I was still teaching at McCann School of Business and Technology, I saw an article in the paper about a Toastmasters club forming in Orwicksburg. The club would be part of Toastmasters International. And according to their website, Toastmasters is an organization of about 345,000 people whose goal is to improve people's public speaking skills and leadership skills by having them attend meetings at one of the almost 16,000 clubs in 140 countries. They believe that by regularly giving speeches and gaining feedback, leading teams and guiding others, they will develop, their members will develop as leaders in their community and in their job places. And they mention that the journey begins with that first speech. So my first speech, my icebreaker speech, if you will, which I titled, I Sleep Every Other Thursday, I talked about my mom and dad and the values they instilled in me and how those values motivated me to give back to the community through my involvement in the Lions Club and the Cancer Society and the other activities that our kids were involved in. It was only in that last paragraph of that speech that I mentioned the fact that I worked for McCann. Now, it was only a few days after that speech that the process that led to me becoming manager of Warwicksburg Borough began. Three months after that first speech, I gave my second speech. By this time, I had been working for the borough for about a month. And in that second speech, titled, Starting Over, Comma, Again, highlighted my career path and the various job changes from when I graduated from college until that day in August of 2005. I talked about how different my life had been from what I had expected. See, when my dad came home from World War II, he went to work for the George R. Habgood Company at Frankfurt and Tarsdale in Northeast Philadelphia. And he worked there until 1977, when the company folded. And that's what I envisioned happening with me. I would graduate from college, get a job with some company, work there until retirement. Well, needless to say, Things did not turn out that way. So I remember sharing that speech with one of my coworkers at the borough. And after she read it, she pointed out something that, frankly, I had not seen. She said, you know, Mike, it's amazing how each step in your journey has led to the next one. And yes, I believe the time working for the borough was a step on my journey to ministry. What I didn't see, but what my observant coworker saw, was that all along, I was on a lighted path. So last Sunday, we heard the story of Joseph, the beginning of the story of Joseph. Our text last week ends with Joseph being taken to Egypt as a slave. When he arrives in Egypt, Joseph is sold to Potiphar. And apparently, Joseph is quite capable because he becomes the overseer of Potiphar's house. And not only apparently is he quite capable, but apparently he's a good-looking fella because he draws the attention of Mrs. Potiphar. Well, he ignores Mrs. Potiphar's advances, so Mrs. Potiphar frames him, and Potiphar puts him in prison. And apparently he was a model prisoner because he becomes overseer of the prison. While he's in prison, two of the inmates he works with are servants of Pharaoh that Pharaoh has placed in prison, and they both have dreams. Joseph tells them what their dreams mean. One of them is released and goes back to work for Pharaoh. Well, a couple of years go by and Pharaoh has these dreams and nobody in Pharaoh's kingdom can figure out what they mean. So this servant says, you know, there was this guy named Joseph. So they bring Joseph to Pharaoh and with God's help. Joseph says, you know what your dreams mean? Your dreams means there's going to be seven years of plenty and then there's going to be seven years of famine. So you better start planning now so you're ready. And Pharaoh says, well, why don't you take care of that? And appoints Joseph, number two in all of Egypt. 
So Genesis 41 tells us that Joseph is 30 years old when he's given control of Egypt. The seven years of plenty go by, and now the famine has struck. Now somehow, even without the miracle of social media, Jacob knows that there's grain in Egypt. So Jacob says to his sons, yo, hightail it on down to Egypt, pick up some grain. But Jacob leaves Benjamin at home. So down they go to Egypt, all but Benjamin, and they meet Joseph. They have no idea who they're talking to, but Joseph knows very well who they are. Now recall last week, that we said that the problems in this family were caused by the brokenness of each family member, including Joseph. So has Joseph changed? Professor Cameron Howard says that Joseph is arguably the original bad guy protagonist. Now, I never watched The Sopranos, but she says that Joseph was Tony Soprano long before HBO came up with Tony Soprano. It's interesting, though, when you read the different commentaries and the different conversations about Joseph in these chapters, the divergent opinions people have. Some of them say, this Joseph, he's manipulative and he's vengeance-seeking. And others say, no, 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 no. We need to give Joseph the benefit of the doubt. He's not seeking revenge. He's simply testing his brothers. When the brothers bow before him this first time, Joseph accuses them of being spies throws him in jail for three days. And after three days, he sends them all away except Simeon. He keeps Simeon and says, you're not getting Simeon back until you bring your youngest brother here. Two years go by. I guess they didn't miss Simeon that much back in the homeland. Two years go by, they're out of food, and they return to Joseph. This time, after Judah guaranteed to Jacob that he would make sure Benjamin was safe, they take Benjamin with them. Joseph gives them more food, sends them all on their way, but before he does, he places his silver, has his servants place his silver cup in Benjamin's sack. They leave. The servants go after them, find the silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Now they're in trouble. Once again, the brothers are bowing before Joseph. Joseph says, eh, go home, but I'm keeping Benjamin here. He's going to be my slave. And then Judah begs to release Benjamin. He says, this will absolutely destroy our father. And this is where our text from this morning begins. 22 years after Joseph was sold into slavery, after Judah convinced his brothers to sell Joseph into slavery, Judah is now pleading for the life of Benjamin. And Joseph could no longer control himself. So what happened? Why did Joseph lose control here and not two years before when the brothers bowed before him? What was different? Was it Benjamin being present? Was it Judah pleading? pleading to take Benjamin's place so Jacob would not suffer? Those are possibilities. But I wonder if there isn't another possibility. I wonder if Joseph at that moment remembered his dream. The dream he had 21, 22 years before, and suddenly Joseph saw the hand of God. Remember, in Joseph's time, dreams were thought to be a divine message, a message from God. So here is Joseph 22 years later, and he remembers this dream of his brothers bowing before him. You sold me into slavery, he said, but God sent me here to preserve life. Now I see the lighted path. Now I see how God used each of these things that happened to me to prepare me and have me in this place to do this work. Remember, God made a promise to Abraham. Descendants, as many as the stars in the sky. The promise was repeated to Isaac and to Jacob. 
If Joseph isn't in Egypt, the promise ends. Instead, the 70 living family members take up residence in Goshen and the legacy of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. Joseph, Jacob, I'll get my J's right, continues. God took the evil actions of the brothers and used it for good. In chapter 50, when the brothers asked Joseph for forgiveness, he reminds them again, what you intended for evil, God used for good. I shared with you a few weeks back about the man who threw the Molotov cocktail at our house and how that incident led to my rewarding experience in prison ministry. What that individual intended for evil, God used for good. But let's be clear. God did not cause the brothers to, throw, to sell Joseph into slavery. God did not cause the arsonist to throw that Molotov cocktail. But God certainly took advantage of both of those incidents. Last weekend, over a thousand terrorists descended on Charlottesville, Virginia, armed with torches, handguns, and assault rifles in order to intimidate and to frighten. They marched in khakis and polo shirts. They no longer feel it necessary to hide their identities. Friday night, while carrying their torches, they surrounded a church where people were peacefully worshiping. One of those people was Reverend Tracy Blackman, our executive minister for justice and witness ministries. She said the terrorists were yelling, blood and soil, a slogan from Hitler's Germany, and Jews will not replace us. Reverend Blackman said that after 30 minutes, the worshipers were able to leave the church through the sliding back doors. They were not permitted to go out the front door because law enforcement couldn't assure their safety if they went out the front door. This is America in 2017, she said. And then you know what happened on Saturday. One of the terrorists, a young man with deeply held radical beliefs on Nazism, drove his car into a group of counter-protesters, killing 32-year-old Heather Heyer. In America in 2017, a woman was killed protesting Nazism. And earlier this week, it was repeated that some of these reported that some of these people were planning a Westboro Baptist Church type protest at her funeral. Now, hate is not something that is only happening out there. This is what a Jewish family in Locust Lake Village found at their home yesterday. Swastikas and other racist messages. And not only that, but it's been the second time since May that their home has been vandalized. Hate has found its way right here in our backyard. Friends, the brokenness that existed in Joseph's time exists today. How evident that has been this past week and a half or so. But Joseph reminded his brothers that they intended to harm him, but God used it for good. The same applies today. The same applies today. The terrorist intended harm in Charlottesville. That young man intended harm when he drove his car into that group of people. These vandals intended harm when they vandalized his home in our community. And white supremacy, white privilege, and racism continue intending harm. But God works in the pain of the world to bring good. I once heard a pastor say, that sometimes when he preaches, he thinks he is the person that needs to hear the message. I'm going to be honest. When we talk about white supremacy, white privilege, and racism, we're talking about lessons I had to learn. I had to sit down and talk to people and hear their stories and then admit I was part of the problem. You see, I use the words that I now abhor. I worked in a department store while in college, and if a group of white teenagers walked through my department, I thought nothing of it. If a group of black teenagers walked through my department, I kept an eye on them. I know I can walk into any store, wear a hoodie while walking in any neighborhood, 
or drive my car on any street and not have to worry about being followed or fear for my safety. I did not have to give our sons the talk when they started going out on their own. That young man picking berries, that's Caden. He's our six-year-old great-nephew. He's starting first grade this year. I only pray that Debbie's niece and her husband won't have to give him the talk. But for that to happen, a whole lot has to change. I pray every day that Caden doesn't wind up martyred like Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, or Philando Castile, just to name three of many. Somehow, I believe somehow, the lesson of Joseph will apply to what happened last week as well. Somehow God will take the ugliness that we witness, not only in Friday and Saturday, but throughout the week, and use it for our good. And we can help. In a speech accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel said, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. So maybe I stand corrected. Maybe it's not that we can help, but we must help. God has no hands and feet on this earth but ours. So if this is going to happen, it's got to be up to us. So what can we do? On the bulletin board, back in the back, is a document titled, Ways to Fight Hate. It lists nine things that each and every one of us can do to tell the hate groups that love is going to win. Last Sunday, we did one of them. We had an interfaith picnic at Blanche Price Park. There's another interfaith opportunity next week down in Stroudsburg. One way we can resist hate and fight evil is by getting to know people. See, hate can be broadcast over Twitter and in impromptu press conferences, but love built is built one relationship at a time. In that second speech I gave to the Toastmasters, I talked about Jabez. Now, Jabez appears in the Hebrew Bible in 1 Chronicles. Now, if you're not familiar with 1 Chronicles, the first nine chapters are really stimulating reading of genealogies. This one was the father of this one, was the father of this one, and this one had three kids, and they had six, and it goes on and on and on. And in the middle of the fourth chapter, all of a sudden, out of the blue, I need to find the editor that snuck it in there and find out why he did. But in the middle of the fourth chapter, we read, Jabez was honored more than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Now, there's no mention of who Jabez's father was or whether he had any children or if he had brothers or sisters or whatever. The only thing we know about Jabez is what it says in the next verse. It says, Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from hurt and harm. And God granted what he asked. In that speech, I shared that I believed going from the faculty at McCann to managing the borough was blessing me and enlarging my border. That same can be said to the transition to ministry. It's blessing me and enlarging my border. So is standing up to hate, fear, and division. And I suspect I'm not alone when I say that. This is going to be something new. This is going to be enlarging me and blessing and expanding my border. Is it easy? No. Are there a lot of other things I would rather be doing? Most certainly. Is it absolutely necessary and required? Most definitely. The prophets told us to seek justice. Jesus told us that whatever we do to the least of these, we do to him. See, what I'm speaking of here is not politics. It's justice. It's biblical and it is the very root and core of our theology. So as we join the battle against hate, 
Let's say the prayer of Jabez together. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from hurt and harm. Amen. Now, if you would please rise in body or in spirit and join in the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> 